So, my friends and I recently played Glenmore Chronicles for the first time. Um, I've played Glenmore way back in the day, the original Glenmore. Um, I played it a few times and eventually traded it away. I don't recall exactly my thoughts, opinions, feelings at the time. It was quite some time ago, probably my first year of gaming, so maybe four or five years ago. More than that by now, my first year of gaming was 2012. Time does fly. Um, in any case, so we played, so I got rid of the original, uh, we played Glenmore Chronicles, and there were mixed opinions, which we'll get to at the end of the review, um, and then we played it a second time this week, and there were continued to be mixed opinions, which I'll get to in the review, um, at, the, at the end of the review. So basically, I'm going to jump quickly into how to play, a very short overview of how to play, nothing crazy, just a very to the point video, um, and then we will touch base again after to see what my friends and I thought, where we disagreed, and what we're doing next about it. See you shortly. So this is the basic setup for a game of Glenmore. You're going to have your tile stacks up top, you're going to have a rondelle around the side, and you're going to have your own player board over here, and other players will have their own player boards as well. So the first player, and the first player is always the player in last place, that's who's considered to be first, they're going to take an action by taking their guy and putting it over here, let's say, any of the tiles, any of the visible tiles are an option for where they can put their guy. And then when they're done taking their guy, they're going to take that tile and add it to their own tableau. Then the next player will go and he'll take a tile, and maybe he takes this one, adding it to his tableau. And this is where the game mechanic is already a little more interesting, because the next player, that's me over here, is going to go over here, and I don't have to. If I skip this tile, if I go to any of these, this tile gets removed from the game. But if I do go to this tile, then I will take this tile, I will add it to my tableau, and then I will activate every single tile, including itself, that it t sorry, every single tile that it touches, including itself. So in this case, I'm going to activate itself, generating a wheat, and I'll come back to how the tiles work in a second, and then I'll activate the two tiles next to it, letting my guys move. Because when you place a tile, there are a few things you need to take into account. The first is that in this top corner over here, the t this corner over here shows you the resource costs that you have to be aware of to potentially pay. You have to pay those resources. This corner over here is the one-time benefits you receive, and this corner over here is what you'll receive every time you activate it. Okay. So when I place this tile, these first few tiles generally have very little resource cost to no resource cost. So I placed it, then I generated a wheat. And the second thing you need to be aware of is when you place a tile, it has to be touching one of your chieftains on the board. It doesn't have to be, it could be diagonally adjacent. Well, it can't be there, it could be over here. It could be diagonally adjacent or actually adjacent, but you can't place it over here if the chieftain's over here. It has to be touching a chieftain, and you'll be able to add more chieftains to the board. So you take a tile, you place it, you activate all the tiles, and then this is already the interesting part. This guy who just went, because he's last, goes again. In Glenmore, whenever you go, whoever's in last place goes, even if that means they are activating multiple times. So it's not always a question of choosing the perfect tile, but rather choosing the, the best tiles that maximize your return. This is actually similar to my review of Agizia in terms of the, the way someone who goes down the Nile can get more activations or more optimized, better activations. Glenmore has the same thing, the whole game just going round and around in a circle. So this guy is going to go again, and he's going to pick this person this time. Because there are two types of tiles in Glenmore, there's regular tiles, and then there, there are these person tiles that do not get added to your tableau. Instead, a person tile goes off to the side, and you'll take one of your little purple markers, or well, in my case, purple, and you'll add it to the person board to take a benefit. So for instance, in this case, I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to take the benefit of this, which is a wheat and a barrel. I'm going to add them to my area. The weed actually goes on a tile. Now this person board has a lot, let me pick it up and show you. This person board has a lot of options that basically will accommodate and match your gameplay choices depending on what you're doing. So to start off, when you put your tile, when you put your things on the board, you start off looking at the lake and you can put something on the board. So I can put this over here for instance, right there. But it has, you have to pay the cost from starting from the lake. So for instance, if I want to go here, this one's free, but to get to here, I have to pay this one coin. And if I want to go here, I have to pay two coins, one for here, one for here. Once you are on the board though, any player can choose to play pay based on where you are. So someone else who goes here, or even myself, 
can pay only one coin. So the board gets more and more accessible the more you spread out. Uh, these starting few tend to be just sheer resources. Once you spread out a bit, you get a lot more in-game activations. And then these final layer in the back here, these purple ones, give you points. So these, these are ways to help you achieve your various goals through other options than just placing a tile. So I placed the person tile, yellow goes, yellow's going to take the another person tile, and then blue's going to go, and blue's going to go over here to get this tile, but blue does not have wheat right now. Let's pretend blue does not have wheat. So if blue doesn't have wheat, they have to get wheat, and they can buy it from the market. So they can buy the, the next available wheat spot from the market, paying two coins, and immediately use wheat. Uh, the market is a place where you can always sell resources. If you have resources, you can always sell to the market. But in terms of buying from the market, you can only buy from the market if there's an available spot. And you can only buy from the market if it's going to immediately result in you buying a good. Uh, you cannot buy from the market if it's just to acquire a good. You have to buy from the market to, uh, what's called, to utilize the good in the purchase of a tile or in the, pur or in the process of a conversion. So, and really, every time you go, you're supposed to be putting out new tiles. Now, something I skipped here, this game, and this, these tiles weren't arranged properly the way it would be in the beginning of a game, but something I skipped here is what happens when you pass, uh, when, you, when you take the last tile from a tile stack. So when you take the last tile from a tile stack, there's going to be a scoring phase um, where you're going to score a bunch of metrics. And these metrics are scored not based on what you have, but based on the gap between yourself and the opponent who has the fewest. So for instance, this one over here is how many people, how many uh, people you have in your main castle. So if I have, let's say, four people in my main castle, and my next opponent has two, and my next opponent has one, then the gap between myself and the lowest opponent is three. And in that case, I will get three points. The other player, who had two versus one, will get one point. And you're evaluating, there's a little chart up here which shows you how many points you get, either one, two, three, five, or eight. Meaning once you get to a gap of four, you get five points. And once you get to a gap of five or more, you get eight points. So the four metrics you're evaluating are how many people are in your main castle, how many, uh, what's it called, how many landscape cards you have, landmark cards you have, which certain tiles, such as Castle Stalker, which I showed you earlier, that symbol right down, there's a landmark card, which are these cards over here. So landmark cards are, well, landmarks, and they're going to give you abilities in and of themselves, but in addition to that, they are counted as scoring measurements when you get those scoring phases. The next one is barrels. So again, people in your castle, landmarks, and barrels. Barrels are one of the one of the resources, but it's not a basic resource that you can buy and sell at the market. Rather, it's a resource that has to be generated or earned in some way. So for instance, this tile over here gives you a barrel when you buy it, and every time you activate it, you get to pay one wheat to get a barrel, every time, and it costs one stone. So barrels are going to be earned throughout the game, just whiskey, alcohol, whatever. Um, and you'll be measuring the gap of how many barrels you have over your opponents. And finally is person tiles. So each person tile will count, the more people tile you have, you'll count the gap between yourself and opponents. And that is one of the, the various scoring metrics in the game. Uh, might be responsible for a quarter to a third of your points, depending on the game that you play and depending on the length and whatnot. But that's definitely one of the ways you score points in the game. Another way you score points in the game, a big way you score points, is going to be through conversions, through t trade tiles, conversions of resources. So if we go over here, we can find one. This is a tile that you can trade in, and you can trade in different resources for points, and the number is you can trade in three different resources for six points. There's a whole bunch of these tiles, and they all activate in different ways. Uh, this one over here is going to be, you can trade in cows and sheep for points. You can either trade in two cows and sheep for five points, or three cows and sheep for eight points. Now all these tiles are going to be giving you various benefits, and additionally this, this main board over here also has the option of giving you points for a variety of options. This one, for instance, is an in-game point system that every time you, ha you generate a movement but don't use it, you can turn into a point. And this one is every time you generate a barrel conversion from that whiskey tile I showed you a minute ago, but don't use it, you get three points. And then these are a bunch of ways to get points. So for instance, this is your river, something I haven't shown you yet, but your center line in, the, in your board is a river. If you have four tiles in your center river, you get five points. If you have six, you get eight points. You can see there's a variety of ways to score points. But then one of the ones that I love the most in Glenmore is at the end of the game, there is a final scoring. And, we, and in the final scoring, past the regular scoring, you'll get the two additional things. You'll get a point for every money you have, which is good. Gives you money, something to do in terms of your money generating throughout the game. And then two is 
you will lose three points per tile in your kingdom that is compared to the person who has the fewest tiles in the kingdom. So for example, if one player has eight tiles, one player has 10 tiles, and another player has 16 tiles, the one with 16 will lose eight times three, meaning they have, more, they have eight tiles more than the one with eight, and they will lose 24 points in, in, uh, from their game, which effectively means that every single time, when, when, when this last player over here goes to over here and takes this tile, and this player goes over here and takes this tile, this player can theoretically take this, 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 and well, all four of these tiles in a row. They can, they have that option. But they have to make sure that every usage, every earning of a tile is worth at least three points plus the opportunity cost of what you could have taken. Because at the bare minimum, a tile is going to cost you three points. If it doesn't generate three points for you, it was a complete waste. In addition to the three points it generates, you have to factor in the opportunity cost of what it could have generated. So you end up with this system where it really, the game really does force you to evaluate whether you want bigger or more optimized. Do you want quantity or quality? And the game does like, over here, this is the end game tableau of the player who won the last game, and he did have the most tiles. But at the same time, while he had the most tiles and while he still won, that penalty brought him to within one point of another player. That's a single single bad decision one way or the other could have made the game because even though he ended initially with 35 40 points more than the other players he took a big hit to his points because of the the gap in how many more tiles he had um, in our case the problem is he was building a engine a trade engine and nobody else is really going for trade engines in this game which basically just gave him a sheer monopoly on trade in any case that is the basics of Glenmore. You go round and around in a rondelle. When you for remove a tile from a final stack, you, you get a scoring and a, a, where you measure four metrics against each other. In the meantime, you'll be putting tiles in your tableau and activating every tile around them. Because every time you place a tile, you activate every tile around them. Um, and then, then you'll have the player board where you are putting uh, your various tokens to indicate various benefits. Something I didn't mention is each spot can only be taken once on the player board. So you have to decide which, which thing you want in game. And some of them will give you competitive advantages, some of them will give you resources or whatnot. But they add a nice element to the game to augment this general movement of the player board. And that's basically it. Uh, that's Glenmore in a nutshell, and I'll get back to my final thoughts in a second. So that's how you play Glenmore Chronicles. That's the quick overview of how to play, just you know, going into it. Um, we were very torn. Uh, we, we played the game. I guess I should say we. I, well, the, after the first play, I would say, let's ignore, let's ignore our thoughts after the first play. Let's focus on after the second play. So after the second play, I really think it is uh, an incredible game given the amount of time you take it takes to play. Meaning when I'm comparing it to some of my, my favorites in the genre, some of my favorites resource building engines, or you know, where you just a pure Euros where you're just trying to get everything done and do as much as possible. And again, I say these a lot, but coin brand, food chain magnet, uh, brass, uh, steam, what else do we have? Uh, Coin, uh, uh, Trois, Troyes, Lorenzo. There's a lot of games that really do give you that incredible feeling of, of the engine and what you're doing with it. And I can't say Glenmore Chronicles does, at least not for us. What I would say is, to me, uh, Glenmore Chronicles is much more akin to, let's say, Concordia, although I do think Concordia is better for the time frame. But it was it was a much lighter fare, but it played in an hour, hour and a half. Meaning on our second game of the second full game, meaning we played the absolute full game, no dice, the tile through the the, the full end of the stack, um, and we on multiple turns, especially towards the end, we definitely had a lot of AP uh, analysis paralysis going back and forth as to well this will net me 14 points and this will net me eight points, but if I do this and then this, there was a lot of AP. This we were not playing a fast, efficient clean game um, and despite that it's our second play with all those all those caveats that can make it as long as possible was only an hour and a half and for an hour and a half I felt Glenmore Chronicles was incredible I felt Glenmore Chronicles really delivered on a great Euro engine building experience for an hour and a half um, I should note by the way we have not played with any of the Chronicles yet we do well We'll see what happens next, but um, we have not played with any of the Chronicles yet. I, I've heard that they that some of them, especially, do add to the game. Uh, so especially, I believe one and two supposedly add a decent amount to the to the gameplay. Uh, but they say mix them in, enjoy, vary your experience, and that will provide, if nothing else, provides variety. If you find yourself playing Glenmore a lot, um, 
I don't know if we'll if it will see play a lot with our group because while I felt that it was a great return on an hour and a half investment of time I can't say my friends felt as strongly uh, one of my other friends meaning that, that I have a variety of people in my game group but there are I would say there are two people in particular who are most available when we're talking about gaming they, they are they enjoy euros to the same way I do they enjoy most of the same genres and games that I do but they are most available there are other people on our group as well but the, the I, I tend to pick my games based on what I think can more easily get to the table and while the, even if other people enjoy the game, to a certain extent, have to factor in that they may not, they may not see play as much if they're the only ones who enjoy it. Um, and I, my two main and most available friends who like the genre were more on the fence. They didn't dislike it, to be clear. They thought it was it was good. Um, but as I've said often to many of my things, many of my, 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 my write-ups, my videos, good isn't good enough these days. Gaming is getting better and better. Every year new and better games continue to come up, continue to come out, not just setting the bar higher for next year's batch of games, but also setting the bar higher for the games you already own in your collection. So good isn't good enough. Now one of my friends said he felt that he'd just rather play another game like Money Kingdoms in that time frame. Which to me actually kind of cemented, not cemented, but solidified my desire to keep Glenmore. Because I felt Bundy Kingdoms was an apt comparison of game return for your time frame. And I think both of them to me fell in the same genre. Meaning they both to me gave the same return. Uh, clearly he preferred Bunny Kingdom, which is fine. We all have our preferences. Um, but I, I thought that both were not my... My fives, so to speak, fives my in my own rating system. Fives my highest rating, uh, but they weren't my fives. Rather, they were my my fours. Great games, really enjoy. Don't compare it to this next tier of games. Um, and so for that, for me, I actually think that I would like to keep Glenmore because I agree with him. It is. I hate, well, I mean, I don't disagree with him. I don't agree with him. He'd rather play Bunny Kingdoms. I thought both were, were good choices if you have an hour and a half of gaming and not two and a half, four hours of gaming. Um, my other friend felt it was also good. Um, he didn't really have as much of a comparison as what he'd do and not do. Um, and now his first game, this was the difference in the first game, his first game was completely marred by the experience because he misunderstood some basic rules that led him to, we, we understood two things. One was some basic strategy. Um, he got, he somehow built up this giant resource building engine in his first game with nothing to return your resources for any kind of points, return, anything. He just had resource production with the only possible option to sell his resources. So he had a terrible engine going just because of the strategy, he didn't have a, none of us had a clear picture of the strategy and he just chose a strategy that didn't work in the context of Glenmore. And then in addition to that, he misunderstood one rule tile that towards the late game when he thought he'd be able to recover and whatnot, he didn't realize that each conversion tile is only one time. You can't convert 14 times. Each time you activate, you convert once. So he thought he'd finally be able to convert all his resources in, and he built this specific plan around that premise, but it wasn't true. So he got he had a terrible first game. But in the second game, he understood the rules perfectly, and won. Like, he won by one point, actually. Like, the game was 98-97, and then I sadly got 68. Um, but anyway, so he won by one point, and it, that was a much better game. It wasn't just a runaway leader. It was a tight game, it was, it was a fight, it was a battle, it was great. Um, but he felt that it, it, something I've driven on, it's driven home before, is I love choices in a game. Even in my fun games, even in my games where it's just fun, I love the context of being able to look back at a decision and say, but we could have done this, but I should have done this, what about that? Meaning I just like choices. In a heavy competitive game, I need choices. Choices are what drives the game for me, otherwise I don't know what, I'm, what am I doing. And in a lighter fun game, I, I enjoy choices and I want choices. Um, they are essential to an extent, but not to the same level and tenseness as I need in a com competitive game. Um, and he felt, I did not feel the same way, he felt that Glenmore Chronicles did not offer anything past quote-unquote obvious choices. He didn't feel that there were really anything other than, well, pick the tile that best fits your strategy and go on. They're all clearly good choices. You just have to figure out a quick bit, bit of math and then done. Um, and I disagree with that primarily because I, I agree with the math part. Ultimately, in the rondelle around you, there's going to be one tile that best gives you a return on points and optimize around that. But there's a much tighter game of, I can get these two tiles, but only if I only if no one else 
goes there or takes this. You're playing with other players, and they all want the same tiles you want to an extent. There are obviously some, strat some tiles are better for you based on your strategy, but there are a lot of good tiles that you have to make decisions about. I can get these two tiles, but then someone else might take that person, or someone else might take that, that lock or castle or whatever tile it is that fits your strategy, and you have to factor that in. I felt there were a lot of decisions to be made based on the rondelle. Uh, the actual putting tiles in your tableau, yeah, you do what's best, and you know you math out a few options, and you go ahead. But the, the, the tableau itself, and then the overarching player board where you put your stuff, I really felt that the decisions were there. Um, I don't know, yeah, I, mean, I, I don't know why he felt didn't, didn't, but I, I felt the decisions in Glenmore were definitely there. So that's where we are. Um, for now, I'm keeping Glenmore Chronicles. For now, I believe it is a game that is well worthy an hour to an hour and a half of your time and delivers a good return on investment for an hour and an hour and a half of your time. At the same time, my friends were... I mean, these are again, these are my main people who we generally agree on a lot of games, so like it, it hurts me to keep a game that they don't see the same way I do. Uh, but yeah, they, they, they felt it was good, but not good enough. Uh, we'll see whether it stays in my collection for the next year, we'll see if it stays in the next collection for the next five years, I don't know. Ultimately, if it's not getting to the table, it will go away. But if it is getting to the table, which I hope it does, I will be very happy with my choice. Uh, that's our review of Glenmore Chronicles. Uh, you can like this video down below. You can subscribe to our video either down below or over here. Please subscribe. You'll get all those pings and notifications um, when we put up a new video or whatnot. I think you actually might actually ring a bell as well. There's a bell. YouTube's gotten weird. Anyways, yeah, you can like, subscribe, watch another video. Come drop by our shop, Board Game Co. We are Board Game Co. We buy, sell, and trade board games. If you want new board games, use board games. We're always adding to our shop every single day. We'll have new stuff available. Uh, I mean, both the latest hotness from our distributors, from more from people, as well as, you know, old and classics. They're just, we just keep rotating games in and out to ensure that everything you ever want is hopefully available to buy, sell, or trade. Well, to buy or trade. You, you do the selling to us, to help us provide. Uh, come on by and have fun. Uh, other than that, have a good one, and I will see you next time.